the answer was basically given by Joe Biden, President, US President Joe Biden, very recently, inadvertently perhaps, when he said, if there was, if there, there was no Israel, we would have to invent one. And he went on to say, oh, I've said this many times before, 5,000 times, he said, in his doddery. I wouldn't, I won't try and get into his accent. <laughs> and then he went to say, you know, it's because we've got these, a sacred, a sacred commitment to Israel based on our shared values, on our shared um, uh, ideas. You know, it sounded, that, that's, that's basically what he said. But it's very interesting that he chose to t remind people that he had said this many times before. But back in 1986, he wasn't president then, but in front of the Congress, he was a little bit more explicit about what he meant when he said it. And I'm going to quote from what he said in 86. Were there not an Israel the United States would have to invent one to protect her interests in the region. Mm -hmm. Now, it couldn't get any clearer than that, could it? Were, it not, were there not an Israel, the United States would have to invent one to protect her interests in the region. He went on to, to underline this. Naked self-interest should always guide United States policy in the Middle East. That's what he said in 1986. Now this, this echoes an earlier, perhaps inadvertent bluntness by another imperial politician. Back in the middle of the 19th century, Lord Palmerston, who was then a British statesman as they called it, later to be briefly become Prime Minister made a statement which has become, you know, famous today. And he said, Britain has no eternal allies. We have no perpetual enemies. Our interests are perpetual and eternal. And this contrast between interests and friends today, I think, is at the heart of a debate which is shaking politics all around the world, including in Australia. Because our political class tells us that their strong support for Israel is based on shared values, on close bonds of friendship, on shared ideas. But this is wearing very thin as the war on Gaza raises the question, what are these values? What are these shared values? Every child, every innocent civilian who is killed in the most horrendous way smashes the argument to smithereens. Interests or shared values? That's a very important question. And I think it's one that we're going to be talking about uh, throughout this, this discussion. Now, the interests of the United States, what are the, these interests of the United States in the region? And I think in popular discussion, it is often summarized in one word, oil. The United States is there to protect oil. There's a little bit of truth in this, but I think it's not all the truth. Now, one there have been many, many uh, expositions uh, on what U.S. interests in the Middle East actually are. And one interesting one which I want to mention comes from the RAND Corporation. Now, the RAND Corporation is a think tank which advises the United States military on policy. It's funded by business interests as well as the State Department. And it defines U.S. interests in the Middle East as ensuring the free flow of resources, so you could say oil is one of those resources, and protecting them from and protecting uh, our allies from external threats, in part to ensure access 
access for US military operations. And here I think we're coming to, you know, what should be our broader understanding of what these interests that are being protected. And I'll be expanding on this uh, throughout the introductory comments on this discussion and we can take it up uh, further. It's more than protecting access to oil. It is, you could say, protecting quite important trade, uh, trading routes, navigation routes, and that's always been in the case of the Middle East. But most importantly, and I think we have to incorporate this as one of the major items, it's about protecting US military power and domination, not just in the Middle East, but in the broader sense around the world. And that has always and has defined the relationship uh, between um, the United States and Israel, but also all the other rich Western countries, including Australia and Israel, who to some degree or another have been pretty much in lockstep with Biden, the Biden administration uh, during this war. Now, back in 1986, when Biden was ultra frank, talking about uh, naked self-interest, he also described um, Israel as the best $3 billion investment we've ever made. Now, $3 billion, you know, um, at the time is actually a lot of money. And currently, the automatic uh, level of military aid from the United States to Israel is set at around 3.8 billion. That was a figure, I think, negotiated on the Obama administration. But it's run roughly on that level, except for a couple of peaks in the 1980s, a huge peak, which is almost equivalent to what the Biden administration is trying to get through the Congress at present. A 14, 14 point something billion dollar extra military aid to Israel. Now, it's stuck for the time being because the Republicans are playing political games with it. They want to tie it to an equivalent amount cut in money made available to chase big corporate tax cheats. And they want to separate it from funding proposal uh, for, for military funding to Ukraine. So it's currently stuck uh, in, 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 in the Congress. Now, all this money, it's a tremendous amount of money. Uh, if, 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 if this is the good deal, you know, <laughs> it really is, it should be referred to as, uh, I think it's a, someone calculated 130 to $150 billion good deal. Because that's the amount of money the United States has sent in military aid since the formation of Israel. And that's just in nominal terms. If it was adjusted for inflation, it would be uh, a, a lot more. Now this, I, I've got a graph that I didn't show, but um, it's very interesting. It was quite modest until the 1967 war. That was an inflection point. Why? And I, I, I was interested reading recently a book, which I highly recommend everybody read uh, by Anthony Lowenstein called the Palestine Laboratory. Now the great news is you can get the digital version from Verso for free. <laughs> Just go and click, download it and you can read it. It's, it's gone through I think two or three rounds of reprints. It's quite hard to get a, printed, uh, a print copy but you can read it straight away. And he goes into this question of what happened in 1967? Well, there was a war, of course. But it wasn't just the US felt this sacred duty to protect Israel. Israel did okay, very well in the end, out of this. It was because at that point, he says, the United States recognized how powerful a local ally, military ally, Israel could be in the region. And it was after that, the money started to flow even, even, even more. Now you could say this is a perverse thing, 
but it's not, because I think we're going to have to reflect about Australia's relationship, the Australian ruling class's relationship, and the Australian government's relationship with Israel in a way that's similar to this. It comes out of an inevitable conflict that flows from the establishment of a European colonial settler state in the Middle East, based on the premise that you could somehow clear the land of the Palestinian inhabitants. That's just one looking for trouble situation. But ironically, it's because it was so provoking of conflict that we got to the situation in 1967 where the United States recognizes how powerful militarily the, United, uh, the, the Israel could be and how useful it could be to protecting their naked self-interest in the region. And after that, they started to make more and more of an investment in it. Caspar Weinberger described it in another way, which was very sharp. Israel is America's unsinkable battleship in the Middle East. Actually, every time I hear that phrase, it makes me feel like, and what is Australia becoming? You know, and we'll come back to this a little later. So at this stage, we start to realize that the United States is not only arming Israel to defend itself, but it is actually helping Israel become a stronger military power in its own right and a stronger arms manufacturer and exporter. And now, Israel has become the 10th largest military exporter in the world. Interestingly, and this is another thing again to go back to thinking about Australian connections, that's the shared aspiration of both Labour and Liberal governments in Australia today. How shameful is that? They want to be number 10. Apparently we're number 15. How did we get there? Quietly, sneakily in the dark, Australia is now the 15th largest arms exporter in the world. It's also the fifth largest arms importer in the world. So we've been stacking up the arms, quietly getting into this position. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm making this comparison to Australia because <laughs> although the topic of this is why the US supports Israel, I think the answer to this question also answers the question why Australia supports the United States, uh, Israel, the United States in supporting Israel. Now, okay. As Israel became more and more powerful, another set of developments started to take place. And again, Lowenstein's book, I think, goes through this very well. You start to find Israel playing a bigger and bigger role helping the United States defend its interests, not just in the Middle East, which it does. In the first instance, by cowing the Arab governments in the surrounding areas from Egypt, well, Lebanon, intervening in necessary bombing. I mean, Israel <coughs> doesn't have to declare war on its neighbors because it just randomly, you know, every other week or sometimes multiple times a week, even before the current conflict, sends its, its, its planes over to bomb targets in Syria. It bombs in Lebanon. It bombs in I I Iran. Nobody says boo. There's no problem in the, there's no, you know, uh, big outroar from the West, uproar from the West, uh, because that's its local policeman's role. But there was another role that was starting to, to grow after 1967 as well. You have Israel military, both training and arming, everything from Colombian, right-wing Colombian death squads, death squads in Guatemala, the South African apartheid state with which it collaborated to get nuclear uh, capabilities, the notorious Shah of Iran, Papa Doc Duvalia and Baby Doc, his son, dictators of Haiti, the Somoza dictatorship in Nicaragua, 
the Rios um, monster dictator who ran Guatemala. And in addition, you could, there's a whole string of other repressive regimes which have had either Israeli arms, Israeli military training, uh, either in the country itself or back uh, in, in Israel. And these include Sri Lanka. Israel was involved in the suppression of the Tamil Elam movement. Even in Burma, Myanmar, it has helped the regime there suppress uh, the, the, the opposition in the past. Okay, so you know you start to get the picture here. The answer to the question is that the reason why the United States supports Israel is that because Israel is actually helping to defend US interests, not just in the Middle East, but actually all around the world. And a certain division of labor started to emerge, which was very interesting. And it's admitted by many Israeli officials at various times. When there was a tricky situation and the United States couldn't go in there and be the ones to provide the arms or the military training, Israel volunteered to do the dirty work to keep the United States slightly at arm's length for whatever reason that they wanted to. Okay. Now, I just want one more point. The whole situation, uh, Lowenstein says, was turbocharged after September 11. And, but actually, this is very interesting. After September 11, it was not just turbocharged with Israel. It, and because I'm, I'm going to shift over to the Australian connection here, it was turbocharged in the relationship that Australia had with the United States and this now combined military industrial uh, uh, complex and strategic military alliance, which serves to defend broader imperial interests and specifically US interests as well. Because after 9 11, all the links start to tighten up. Now when we look back and where people are writing and not getting reported in the mainstream media at all about the role, say, Pine Gap plays yeah, in yeah. helping Israel target Gaza. Yeah. Now all that didn't just take place after October 7. Now <laughs> you're joking. It started to take place by degrees after September 11 and after the invasion of, of, of Iraq. The direct links were made when Pine Gap, according to Peter Cornell from Australia, Declassified Australia, from Pine Gap through the NSA in the United States directly to the IDF, targeting information, critical to the war that's being waged now. So it's turbocharged, this whole relationship. I think this is also quite interesting because it reminded me of a, an idea. When the revolutionaries of, at the beginning of the 20th century were discussing war, one of the popular things was to quote from a German military expert called Clausewitz, who said, war is a prosecution of politics by other means. And in the debate, Lenin actually made the point and said, oh, it's a bit more than that. It's actually the prosecution of economics. Says, I'm summarizing, he didn't actually say those words, by other means. And what he meant is that don't just look at war as a policy option. You know, don't look at it purely in the context of the politics of the moment. Try to understand the political economy of the situation that underlies this. And I think this has become much more concrete now for us in our vantage point in Australia um, because we are becoming more and more in our relationship to this US-led imperial war machine, more and more like Israel. Now, of course, we have another connection with Israel because Australia was a colonial settler state, European colonial settler state. So we have the legacy of those attitudes such as racism, which are quite deeply ingrained. 
a sense of entitlement, a sense of looking down on the people who were first year, to think either that they were inconsequential or they were not quite human. All these things that we now see, and I guess we should be looking at when we see the sort of like crazed Arab hatred that's coming out from Israel, we can reflect. That was, that was part of the culture that came with a colonial settler state in Australia as well. So I think, I think we can understand this really well. And I'm, I'm actually hoping that this is actually something that's helping people in this country understand what's right and what's wrong today. And, and, and which is why it's, it, 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 it's so clear. Many of the demonstrations that we've been going to over the last eight, eight weeks, is it? Eight or nine weeks. There have been young First Nations militants coming up and identifying with this because it's very obvious uh, the connections that I had here. Now this integration, I think it's actually quite a, we can learn from what happened in the case of Israel because it very directly, it, it shifts from just strategic military partners <laughs> for a moment, its economic side starts to grow and grow and grow and actually it becomes as much an economic relationship as a political one. So I, I think we can see this now. We can see, we can see in the disconnect that we are seeing between the political class in this country and what more and more people are feeling, there is something else coming into it. This whole business of, oh, you know, but what's wrong with creating jobs, building nuclear submarines? And what's wrong with all these factories that now seem to be making various parts of the F-35 warplane. You know, that's the top of the range US warplane, which is only supplied to the closest allies, including Israel, Australia, and a few other countries. And as somebody uh, um, who was studying this actually, you know, produced uh, a diagram, which the Defense Department, Australian Defense Department put out in 2018, Showing, oh, this bit's made by this Australian company, this bit's made by another Australian company, you know, and there was all this stuff going on in Parliament about, oh, you know, we can't tell you what we're exporting in military because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big secret. I think it was October 30 or something. You know, after October 7, Defence Department, like, you know, not pretending, like, acting like nothing else is happening, puts out a boastful media release saying, oh, we, this new company in Melbourne has got a contract to build another part of the F-35. And we're giving them a subsidy. And we've already uh, contributed, you know, X billion dollars to other companies uh, to produce various components of, of the F-35. So what I'm saying here is that it's very interesting, I think, looking at what happened with Israel from the point of 1967, the military aid, and realizing it is more than just, you know, money to help them wage war. It's actually made them part of the machine that now is all totally integrated. And with this integration, I think, comes a, a big integration of capital. And that's another part which is very true about Australia, is that Everybody here, when they think of foreign capital, you know, you're encouraged to think, oh, Chinese buying up this or Chinese yeah. buying up there. But actually, it's US capital and Australian capital are so enmeshed. The biggest capital flows are in the both directions. Australian capitalists are putting money into US businesses. US businesses are putting money into Australia. And when it comes to the arms industry, it's like the golden goose for business because it's all government subsidies you know, subsidize. You're bound to make a profit because the state and the ordinary taxpayer in the end is going to make sure that you are going to make a profit from it. So, okay. Another aspect, and I think, you know, I'll start, try, start to wind up on this. Another aspect of looking at this question of what these interests, this alliance that we, Australia is part of, is defending in the world today is to understand the moment in which the countries, the rich countries that have actually dominated the world, 
since before the beginning of the 20th century until now still take the lion's share of its resources, have the highest per capita income around the world, and every map you get of global inequality, you see the same old pattern, right? It hasn't really shifted, even though they like to scare everybody about how powerful China is. If you compare GDP per head, they're still down there with the poor countries. And Australia is up there with rich countries, right? We're the club, and we're trying to defend this privilege. And I think that's, that's what's happening now. There is some truth to the fact that the United States is now feeling challenged by China in particular. I, I don't think they can say they feel challenged by Russia in a new way. Because in, in, in many ways, the power that Russia has in world politics today, this is remnant military power, is a legacy of another era. It's not fundamentally you know, from the present time. They had that military power for a long time. But China is the place where there is an economic development which has been, well, it has been encouraged and, 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 and lived off by the United States and other Western capitalist powers. They found it, they made it into the world's factory to save costs. But now they have a problem because that also meant that China is developed and its economy is growing. And as its economy grows, it has the capacity to spend a bit more money on military. It's still nothing compared to the United States. But it's beginning to pose the possibility that one day, in a place not very far away from China, actually very damn close, they might theoretically have or soon have the political or military power, if they wanted to, to invade Taiwan. Which is very interesting. You know, why is all this focus, when we talk about Australia's role in these machines, all the focus on oh, Taiwan, is though suddenly Australia, who didn't express much concern for the people of Taiwan, ever before, all of a sudden is focused on this thing. And it really is all about this military calculation. That the United States might lose the dominance it has, up until now, still has, military dominance, that goes all the way up to the border of China. It makes you think of another thing, you know, when you think the Middle East, and you think, okay, if one of the interests that they're protecting trade routes, what are they actually, what's that mean? That's a possibility. And it's happened before. The Suez Canal was closed at one stage by Egypt briefly. And, you know, you can imagine the same could happen. You know, uh, Iran might be able to stop shipping for a while, you know, or whether it's directly or through the, through, 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 through the Houthi rebels in, in Yemen. But it's, it's almost nothing. What they're trying to protect, I think, is actually not the free trade. I mean, that's the thing which you often when you think of China, you think, why does, why does the United States and Australia have to send warships there to protect those lanes of trade when those lanes of trade are China's lanes of trade? You know, it's China's the one that's going to lose the money if those trade routes are blocked. What is actually being protected? I think it's more like protecting the possibility or the power of the United States to block to lock China in, to do the blockades, because that's what the United States has up to now enjoyed. It can actually stop trade going to other countries. So I, I think that that's an important context to remember, even in the Middle East. The United States sends its aircraft carriers down there, not really fundamentally because there is a threat to shipping, but it wants to have to control the tap. And that's an important part of maintaining its power. So I think we have to contextualize this question of the threat because I think there has been a change and it, it, it happened as a byproduct of the United States corporate class and all the other Western corporate class trying to solve its economic problems by offshoring uh, production or some production into China. But now they want to have the ability to choke it if they can 
and they want to have the ability, and this is connected to military power, and the links that Israel, Australia, and the United States have in all these military export deals, because there's a lot of, a lot of it now is not about just, you know, the guns and the bombs and the tanks and the, and the planes. It's about, it's about the sophisticated technologies. So part of this thing is the ability to block, to withhold or to block countries like China from getting technologies of a higher level. So there's a kind of a, another thing, another military objective here, which is the protection of monopoly of high-end, of high-end industry or high-tech industry. And that's another element here. And I think Israel's role in the whole military industrial complex quite focused on that, on, on, on the technological side, on the, on, on the software and the side of, of, of the business. And Australia would like to be in that game as well. And that's the point of corruption for a lot of institutions, including the universities around Australia, because that's the deal. They want all your students to come in there and help this military industrial complex uh, develop the skills uh, to continue to have a domination, to be able to block the transfer of property. Now, of course, it's very interesting. If you think back to the 19th century, where the US was there, before it became the dominating power in the world, their attitude, their attitude was, no, nah, you've got to allow ideas and technology to freely go around. It was, they considered a restraint on free trade if you tried to copyright and hold on to ideas. That was their attitude then. Now they're the top dogs. They want to hold uh, everything else. Okay, to finish off, I think I want to go back to some good news. Because I think this whole contradiction between the interests on one hand that are really being defended and the kind of rhetoric of shared values, bullshit, 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 is <laughs> coming into a tectonic clash and in Australia, I think we're winning the battle for hearts and minds. These demonstrations that we've all been part of over this last year have not been in vain. And, and I wrote an article which will be in the Green Left that comes out this week. I found this poll by Roy Morgan. It wasn't very widely reported and for good reason. They took the poll, I think, November 9th. And Roy Morgan asked the right question for a change. Yeah. Unbelievable. Do you support or do you want an immediate withdrawal of Israel from Gaza? That's a good question, I thought. Yeah. Guess what? A majority said yes. 51%. Okay, do not get too excited. 51%. But 60 is a majority. We win already, yeah. <laughs> Let's have democracy, okay? Yeah. But... Even more interesting, 65% of 18 to 34 year olds yes. said immediate withdrawal. 64% yes. of women said immediate withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So now we know where the vanguard is in the mm -hmm. movement. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah.